I'm just trying to sort something out here. Okay, there we go. Welcome to session five, guys. Thank you for for making it on time today. Today we're going to go through the aquifer testing component of the groundwater resource development process. Um, just to give an outline of the session. Uh, first, I'll just go through the groundwater project again. I mentioned it briefly in the last session. Um, it's a really good initiative. And then uh, we'll go through the schedule for next week and uh, the weeks after that. First part of the aquifer testing, we'll go through the method selection, what methods there are, how to choose the one that you need. And then the big three, we'll do falling head or slug tests, pumping tests, and then sustainable yield determination. And then we'll go through our questions like we usually do. Yeah, so the groundwater project is quite, uh, it's quite a nice initiative that the, the IAH has started. Um, you know, you register on the website and you get access to a lot of useful and uh, sort of critical materials. Your Freeze and Cherry Groundwater is one of the first books that they've made available. Um, there's a very nice children's book as well that, um, you know, if you've got kids, that'll be quite useful. It, it tells the story of groundwater in a nice kid-friendly way. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Apparently right. someone can't hear you. No, yes. that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> um, okay, so everybody can hear now. Yes. Uh, Antonio, can you hear? Well, let me type it rather. Okay, great. Sorry, the chat doesn't come up automatically on my uh, screen. So I miss it. But um, yeah, I recommend you guys go have a look at the Groundwater Project and follow them on LinkedIn. A really, really good project to get involved in and uh, become a part of. In schedule, today we're doing the aquifer testing. Then next week on Thursday, uh, we'll look at groundwater characterization. Uh, this, this one is one of my sort of personal critical areas that I think is a lot of value or adds a lot of value to any study that you do, whether it's mining, domestic, anything, because this is where you start to develop your conceptual model of the site. And then the 14th of August, we'll do an introduction to groundwater modeling, just high level uh, introduction there. Okay, so the first part we'll go through uh, with aquifer testing for groundwater resource development is selecting your aquifer test method. Yeah, the most commonly applied types of aquifer test are pumping tests, constant head tests, slug tests. I'm sure you've all heard of these or seen them or encountered them somewhere in your sort of academic and uh, consulting career. Yeah, so you break it into these three. There are other complicated methods, which is your packer testing or illusion testing. Um, not necessarily interchangeable, but uh, you know, we deal with packer testing. And then the relatively new one is downhole flow logging. I'm not going to go through those in detail because you don't really use them that often in my experience, but just so that you know they're out there. Okay, so pumping tests. Your pumping test, you stress the aquifer by abstracting water at a known rate with a response in water level measured in the abstraction borehole and surrounding boreholes, if you're lucky enough. You can either have a constant discharge rate test or a step test, also called a variable discharge rate test. And you conduct pumping tests to identify your hydraulic parameters in the aquifer 
aquifer boundaries, such as recharge boundaries, no flow boundaries, etc., and your sustainable yield values. The pumping test is the only way you can really determine your uh, sustainable yield value. All the other methods, you can do it with a slug test as well, but it's an indicative value. It's not uh, as accurate as a pumping test. Commonly applied solutions to determine your parameters is the taste type curve matching and the Cooper Jacobs straight line fitting methods. Other type is a constant head test, which we don't apply as, uh, as much in the industry as pumping tests or slug tests. You know, the head in the abstraction well is maintained as a constant and the discharge rate is monitored. We often call this a farmer's pump test because this is how the farmers sort of test their hole. And I'm sure um, anybody that's dealt with the farmers before will, will agree with us. They buy a pump and they put the pump in the hole and then they vary their rate so that the drawdown stops in the borehole. And then that is their sustainable, in inverted commas, sustainable yield. Water Affairs doesn't accept this in a water use license. Um, you know, this kind of fitting your, your pump rate to the drawdown. You can use them to determine the aquifer parameters such as transmissivity, conductivity, and storage. And you can apply this for artesian borehole characterization. Someone raised the question uh, with the previous session about artesian boreholes. Yeah, this is one of the ways you can test your artesian borehole. And the third type of test is a slug test, where the water level in the borehole has changed instantaneously, or at least as close to instantaneously as possible, and the recovery response of the water level is measured. Now this is a slug, and you've got your dip meter, and then you've got electronic logging equipment over here. So typically we'll raise the water level in the borehole, either through adding a known volume of water or through a slug, which is this that causes displacement of the water. But you can also do it through the removal of water as well. And this one's a bit more challenging because you're going to have to sort of pull your baler up out of the borehole very quickly. So you can only do it in really shallow wells, shallow boreholes. You use this one to determine your aquifer parameters. Yeah, usually we do it for um, hydraulic conductivity and you use curve fitting methods which we'll go through in the next part of the, the slide. Uh, sorry. Um, everybody happy with the types of aquifer test so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great stuff. Yes. Great stuff. So I'm going to carry on then. Um, selecting your aquifer test. The type of aquifer test that we do is dependent on the type of data we need and then the confidence level required. Remember your cost and time increases with the confidence in your results required. So in the context of aquifer tests, Cheap and nasty slug tests can take you anywhere from half an hour up to three hours. That'll be over here, but you can't buy a pump and spec it and get your water use license on it. To get that, you're gonna have to do a long duration, constant, dura uh, constant discharge rate test, and it's gonna take you a lot longer and it's gonna cost quite a lot more, but it's gonna give you the confidence. The two main reasons for aquifer testing or characterization of the aquifer, getting your aquifer parameters to feed into your numerical modeling maybe, or to, to look at developing a well field, you know, getting a, a feeling of what the aquifer is capable of, and then your sustainable yield determination, which is if it's a specific borehole for a specific cause to do water supply with. 
the things you consider when selecting your aquifer testing method what information do i need from the test yeah that's in the previous slide we went through that uh, what's the borehole information how deep is the borehole how deep is the aquifer yeah because a slug test is not going to work if your water level is sitting at 120 meters because yeah, it's just going to be too time consuming. Your to add a slug into that volume is going to be quite uh, quite heavy going. So it's better to just do a pump test. Are there observation boreholes available? Yeah, observation boreholes are boreholes that you're not pumping from. Uh, are there potential aquifer boundaries at the site? Do you know that there is a dike nearby? Do you know that there's a river nearby that it's going to interact with? Is there access for your equipment? Yeah, if you can't get your pump, your testing pump down the borehole, then you can't really do a pump test. You know, um, what happens sometimes is that people will build, they'll buy the, the farm portion and then they'll subdivide it and they'll build a house right next to the borehole and you can't get your pump equipment in there. So you sort of have to, you're limited in the pump test that you can do or the aquifer testing. And then also your equipment, your measurement equipment. If you can't fit your dip meter down the borehole, then you can't do a pump test. Pretty straightforward. And then do you have any water quality issues? Yeah, for your discharge of the, the pump test water. Yeah, I had a site recently where we needed to pump an underground cavity that was filled with acid water. Uh, pH was about two. So we had to pump the water. We sort of designed the project to pump the water into a truck. Then the truck took the water away and disposed of it uh, at some way that was licensed properly. So you got to take that into account as well. And obviously you don't want to do that pump test for 10 days or five days. Okay, is there space for discharge? Yeah, can I physically, if I'm going to be pump testing for three days, is there space for me to discharge? Um, if you're going to be, you can only discharge 10 meters away from your borehole, your discharge is just going to be pumping right back into the hole and you're not going to get drawdown after a, after a certain amount of time. So you need at least 30 to 50 meters away from the borehole for your discharge pipes. So does this all make sense to you guys so far? Yes. Yes, it does. Awesome. Let me just check the chat. I see that's blinking at me. Yes. Okay. So first section, this is something that came up yesterday is the, the falling head or your slug tests. Yeah, in these tests, a small volume of water is added or displaced or removed from a borehole, then the rate of rise or fall of the water level recorded. So that's why it's called the falling head test, because you raise the water level, then you watch it fall. Same as the rise, you, you call them where you remove the water, a rising water level test. Uh, but personally, I've never done that. Um, I've never figured out how to remove the water quickly enough. Slug test will tell us transmissivity or hydraulic conductivity of an aquifer. And rule of thumb, if the transmissivity is more than 250 meters squared per day, the slug test won't work without a super sensitive automated logger. So you can get per second interval measurements. Because think about it, your water, you're going to add 100 liters or 50 liters. It's just going to go straight down the hole your water level is going to rise two centimeters and recover almost immediately. So these tests don't generally work in caustic environments or high yielding alluvial aquifer environments. Just bear that in mind. It's relatively simple and low cost to do. Um, it's useful for initial estimates of aquifer properties and also areas where you have low potential. You know, if you're in an area where the blow yield of the hole was 
just seepage, but you still want to develop the hole or your client does, a slug test will give you a good indication of what kind of pump you can recommend to the guy, um, despite your sort of best efforts to convince him not to pump. Because if you do a pump test on these low yielding holes, it can burn your pump out because they run dry so quickly. Then here we've got just some examples of how they work. You've got this A and B is the displacement test, which we typically use. This is your slug. Drop it down, you get your change in head. So there's my initial water level. Drop it down, head rises, and eventually it falls down again. C and D, that is where you take out a fixed volume of water, you cause a sort of negative displacement here, and then it recovers over time. This is the same principle as if you pour water in, because the water will also raise your water table in the borehole. Okay, so the process we follow, the initial water level is measured, and then a fixed or a known volume of water is added to the borehole, and the change in your water level is measured. Now this, your measurement here needs to be taken as quickly as possible. So what I typically do is, I've got my bucket, you know, 50 liters or whatever it is, and um, I measure the static water level, and I calculate if I add 50 liters to a borehole of a diameter 165 millimeters, this is how high it should displace at maximum. Then you set your dip meter at that height so that when you pour the water in, you're not going to be chasing the water level up and down because some of these pump the slug tests only last five minutes. So if your dip meter is getting stuck and you know, you're not going to get any useful information. So you measure your water levels at uh, fixed time intervals. So this is an example of the times that I use. So I use 30 second intervals up to five minutes. And then after that, you go two, three, five minutes, all the way up to hourly when you get towards the end. And then you interpret them and you correlate it to any borehole logs that you might have, your geotechnical logs. Um, your geological logs, anything that you might have that can contextualize the results you see. Okay, so the interpretation of the slug tests, I'm only going to go through the two sort of main methods that we use. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but for slug tests in a confined aquifer where the borehole is fully penetrating of the aquifer, we use the Cooper method or it's the Cooper et al. method. And then for slug tests in unconfined aquifers with a fully or partially penetrating borehole, we use the Bauer-Rice method. This is the one that I learned in university as well um, at Free State. So I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with it, or hopefully. So the Cooper method, You've got your volume of water V added to a ball of a known finite diameter of 2RC. And this causes an instantaneous change in head of the borehole, which is H0. You see that there. And H0 is equal to the volume divided by pi R squared. So that's what I was saying to you, just to sort of thumb suck how high your water level is going to go when you add your water so you can get your dip meter ready. You can use this equation. Okay, your head at time t is equal to your initial displacement and a function of alpha beta. Or you manipulate the equation to go like that, where your alpha you can see the mathematics here. You've got effective radius of the screened or otherwise open part of the well, which is your EW. And then storage, your radius of the unscreened part of the well where your head is changing. And then you've got K coming into it here. 
I'm not going to go through the maths in detail with you guys. This is just to show you what sort of considerations you give to it. Or do you want me to go through the maths? Nobody. Okay. I'm just going to skim the mathematics part then. Just so that you're aware that the, you know, what the equation looks like. But then we'll focus more on practical applications. So your D is your thickness there. So K times D gives you your transmissivity. And there's your HT. Your head at time, whatever. And then you get this one. Yeah, I'm not even going to try to read that one to you guys. But um, so there's your function of alpha beta. And at the end of the day, it's a, it's a curve fitting exercise. So you can see here log alpha is minus one, two, three, etc. And you will fit your curve on here, the one that you generate with your, um, your data. So that's a log lin um, axis, so semi log graph. I'll just show you once. I'll, I'll just go through the Cooper Jacob or the Cooper assumptions. The aquifer, the, the solution assumes the aquifer is confined, homogeneous, of infinite aerial extent and of uniform thickness across the area that's affected by your slug test. The pre testing piezometric surface is near horizontal. The head in the ball is changed instantaneously when you add your slug, it's instant goes up to H0. And then the flow to or from the ball is in an unsteady state. Rate of water flowing from the well to the aquifer is equal to the rate of change in well bore storage volume with changing head. So that's, it's saying as quickly as the water level is dropping, when I add water to it, that is how quickly the aquifer is accepting this water. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now it's, uh, it's just something to wrap your head around. And then the inertia effect, the nonlinear well losses are negligible. That's what the assumption is. And the borehole penetrates the aquifer fully. What that means is just, you haven't drilled into the top of the aquifer and then stopped. You, you've gone right through the aquifer. You're pulling as much as you possibly can from that aquifer. Then the borehole diameter is finite and thus you have to consider well bore storage, which is related to this rate of change in well bore storage volume. Coming back to the, the aquifer. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a quick um, let me just do this. I just want to show you guys how to do your interpretations. So, bear with me. Okay, I'm going to share Excel. Then I'm just going to open my step test example. Can everybody see Excel now? Yes. 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 Great. Okay, so here's my little example data set of a slug test. Now I've got my static water level at 13.99. I'm just going to zoom in for everyone. Borehole depth is 50. And then here's my measurements. So who can tell me what my H0 is? What's my initial displacement? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> so first thing you do is you calculate your 
your drawdown or your displacement, whatever you want to call it. So that one we say my measured water level because I've raised the water table minus my static water level. And I'm going to make that static water level constant. And I'm going to do that all the way down. So you can see my initial displacement is 0 0.88 meters. Um, Matthew, mm. I'm sorry, are you working on the Excel right now or are we supposed to, like, I'm not seeing what you're talking about. As I can't a, see what you're talking mm -mm. I think What's, we're looking at the CDT Excel sheet. Okay. Yeah, sorry, let me... I thought it shared the application. Okay. Yeah. Can you see a slug testing now? Yes, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know this program that well. Okay, so what I've done now, you can see the equation. I've just said my measured water level minus the static water level because I've added water and I've raised the water table gives me my displacement or my drawdown. Mm. So I'm just going to do a quick graph. Just to show you what the curve looks like. You see, so at zero, we've got the initial static water level raises up to here and then it goes down. Then I'm just going to go back to PowerPoint. I just want to show you the equation so that you sort of familiarize yourself with this thing. I don't know what it's done now. Okay, anyway, we'll look at it just now. Sorry, guys. Now I'm going to go into... How many of you guys are familiar with Equity Solve? The software. I am... Okay, great. I've never worked with it before. I'm not. Okay. I, I'd recommend you guys go to the Equity Solve website and just uh, download a demo of it because this is really one of the, um, the sort of better ones in my experience. You know, it's got, uh, it's got most of the solutions that you need. So just Google Equity Solve. Yeah, it's over there. Um, but then let's just go through this quickly. So we'll go to a slug test. And you set your units consistently. So meters for my measurements, minutes for my observation measurements. And then I want my hydraulic conductivity in meters per day or my transmissivity in meters squared per day. So we set it like this, meters per day K. Okay, there you can put in whatever details you'd like. Okay, so here we go. We're going to put in 0 0.88 here. That's my initial displacement. And then this H is your static water column height. So it's from the bottom of my borehole to the top of the borehole. And on this one, my static water level was 13.99 and my borehole depth was 50. So I'm going to make it 36. That is from the base in my borehole up to the static water level. Go next. Saturated thickness of the aquifer, I'm going to assume is a 36. The depth, I'm assuming that the borehole is open. Length we leave as default. 
The radius of the well casing is a 165 millimeter borehole, so 0 0.165 meters. The equipment of my downhole, the radius of my downhole equipment is negligible. I'm going to leave it at zero. I don't have a packer. And then the outside radius, I'm just going to leave default as one. Okay, these ones, not going to go into those ones. So then you put in your observations, which I will do quickly. Okay, so that's just a copy paste exercise. Matthew, may I please ask? Mm. Um, when you're conducting a survey on the field, right, would mm -hmm. your observation borehole be your neighbor's borehole? Is that where you're going to get the data from? Um, no. So your observation in this, uh, this sort of case, sorry, I've done something wrong here. Um, your observation well here is the, the well itself. You know, with a slug test, you don't usually have a, a second observation well. So yeah, you're observing at the borehole that you're testing. Oh, okay. Okay, does it make sense? Yes, kind of. Okay, uh, it's with pumping tests that you'll go look at the neighbor or, um, you know, those kind of things. But with a slug test, you're not going to, you know, when you're adding 50 liters to a borehole, you're not going to impact your neighbors or you shouldn't. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to look at displacement time. You can see when I plotted on a log graph, uh, linear for the draw displacement and log for time, I get this curve. I'm going to match it to the Cooper Jacob. You see it's Cooper, Bredehoft, and Papadopoulos, um, but we call it the Cooper method. I'm just going to do it automatically. Okay, so you see there is my curve for this borehole. My transmissivity is 100 meter squared per day. Okay, so that's a very quick um, quick and dirty example. Any questions from that? I know it's very very high level but uh, is there anything glaring that you don't understand? Um, yes. Um, how do you produce now your results? Is, there, is your results the graph? Uh, your results is your transmissivity. Um, you know, that's what you're trying to figure out there. So, um, let me just see uh, if this works in terms of the... Okay, so what can you guys see now? Can you just see the PowerPoint or can you see PowerPoint with a participants list? Just uh, I can't. Yeah. No. So what you're going to do in your reports is you're going to um, put in your transmissivity that you've calculated. The graph is. Um, yeah, the graph is sort of in your appendix. You'll say, "This is how I got this." Okay. Okay, so that software mm -hmm. solves your transmiss transmissivity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. No, I don't know. So here's your line fitting graphs. Okay. Do you see them? Yes. Okay. So the software has fitted this, uh, your data onto one of these type curves, and then it has done this, which then gives you your conductivity, 
multiplied by your aquifer thickness that you assigned, which gives you transmissivity. So that's why I didn't go through the mats because I'm not going to teach people how to do this. You know, this is way above my pay grade. Okay, so the software does all of this for you by fitting it onto this curve, the top curve. Okay. Okay. Okay, then Lizelle, you had a question. I'll get to Razani now. Um, no, I figured it out in the meanwhile. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Razani? Oh, yes, thank you. So the software that you were, I mean, you used to generate the graphs, um, I guess um, it actually has a way of um, importing your, um, your plots. I mean, like exporting them. Can you export them or you just, you know, it's one of those where you just have to screen, screenshot it. No, no, no. You, you print it as a, a PDF. The, you know, the PDFs uh, show your location, all of that information that you type in your client name, your location of the borehole, it's all on a PDF that you can print out. Um, so, and you can screenshot if you really want to. I've seen a lot of consultants do that. I don't do it, but uh, you can do it. All right. Um, I'm just saying because, you know, if you want to insert the graph into your report, mm -hmm. it might be easier to, to insert it as an image than a PDF. Um, look, if you're doing it in your report, I personally, I just take the Excel graph. Um, you know, because the only thing that Equity Solve really adds to the, the graph is the line that you're fitting it to. And if I'm just discussing the response and the, the sort of recovery of the water level, I just take the Excel graph. It's a lot easier. I understand. Thanks. Cool. Okay, Neil? Uh, I just want to add to you, uh, I believe the demo version, you cannot export the data, but you can just snip it, take a screenshot and add that image to your report or so on. Okay, and then in terms of functionality, Neil, you know, I haven't looked at the demo in years. Um, does it have limited functionality or can you do everything? Um, the demo can actually do, well, what I saw is it can do any, everything the, the paid version can do except exporting. Okay, no, thank you for sharing. Uh, Great. Uh, so then the second one is, uh, can I carry on? Sorry, guys. Yes, you can. Awesome. So the second one that we look at and the one that's a bit more common, I feel, in my experience is the Bauer-Rice method. This is included in FC as well, which we'll go through later. Um, for flow into a well, Q after the removal of a slug of water, your Q is equal to two pi conductivity. And then your, you know, your head at time T and then your radius of the well and your effective radius. So it's similar um, parameters from the last one. And the rise of the head, the rate of rise, so change in head over change in time is equal to negative your rate of flow into the well, then your RC, which is the unscreened part of the well radius, squared times pi. Then you combine the equations to calculate your K. Again, be familiar with this equation, sort of look at it for what it is. It's just an equation to see what's important, what is going to influence my um my answer is it the yeah is it the thickness of my aquifer that i've assigned is it the radius of the well that i've assigned just be aware of the parameters you don't have to know these equations 
Okay, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff. So you can see with the Cooper, they assumed fully penetrating. Whereas Bauer Rice, they have an equation for both partially penetrating wells and fully penetrating wells. So you can do a sanity check on your results if you have to. And here is your equations. So D is your thickness of screen part or small letter D. Big D is the total saturated thickness. B is the saturated thickness that you've intersected if it's partially intersected. And then 2RC is your diameter of the well. Again, don't focus too much on this, guys. And the key assumptions of your Bauer Rice method aquifer is unconfined and of infinite aerial extent. It's homogeneous, isotropic, and uniform thickness where your slug test is having an impact or an effect. Your pre testing piezometry piezometric surface is near horizontal. Head in the ball is changed instantaneously. The flow is in a steady state to and from the borehole. Your inertia effect and non-linear well losses are negligible. And the borehole penetrates the aquifer fully or partially. And again, bore, well bore storage cannot be neglected. So very similar to Cooper Jacob, just key differences in that it's unconfined and it's in a steady state flow. Yeah, and I'll just do a quick So you see, can everybody see equity solve again? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Klingiwe, you got a question. Um, yes. Um, out of curiosity, for the when you're using Bauer and Rice, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like, because there's equations for both when it's fully penetrated and if and when it's not fully penetrated. How like how would you know if you've fully penetrated the the aquifer? Like, <laughs> uh. I, I yeah. I agree with you. Um, you know, it's just sometimes you'll know because you've drilled other boreholes. Um, but for the most part, you just assume that you've penetrated the full aquifer. Um, you'll see it with your drilling. If you've gone, you've drilled through your sandstone and your fractured zones, and then you hit into a hard dwaka or basalt mm -hmm. or something. Um, but typically, you'll just assume that you've done full penetration. Uh, okay. No, thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay, so now you see on the Cooper solution, we've got a curve. So it's like an S almost, a backwards S. I'm just going to change the, I'm going to use the same data set. I'm going to look for the unconfined solution here. Bauer Rice. And you see it's a straight line now. And we're on a linear time graph and a log displacement graph. So you just get a general line of fit. See it fits most of your data points and it gives me a hydraulic conductivity, not a transmissivity of 0 0.8 meters per day. Okay, so you see, you, you try to fit your line to the majority of your data points. Yeah, you can fit it to late time data if you want to. That gives you 0.72. Early time gives you 0.81. So 0.79 is, is representative of this, in my opinion. Okay. Yes, Victor. Oh, yes, Matthew, thanks. I uh, just want to ask that uh, <clears throat> because this one of uh, unconfined aquifer is giving us the K, not uh, the transmissivity, is it because the, um, it's like it's, it's a bit difficult to find uh, aquifer thickness in unconfined uh, situation? 
Um, it, it's not the, it's not that it's an unconfined aquifer or confined aquifer. It's just the solution. Um, so it's the Bauer Rice method. It's not that it's an unconfined or confined aquifer. It's just purely the solution solves for K and not T. Oh, okay, no thanks. Okay, um, so it, it's got nothing to do with unconfined or confined. You know, if you look here, I'll put it back on confined aquifers. So there is a Bauer Rice solution for confined. So I'm just going to go to this Dawadi Babu. You see there it solves for T as well, but it's also got S and KZ over R and then SW. So each equation will have the things that it solves for. It's not necessarily the, the type of aquifer that you're in. Okay, no, thanks, thanks. Cool. But Pelo, you got a question? So basically when you have this software, right, you don't have to conduct any hand calculations. Um, you mean use those monster equations in the, the presentation? Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And even if you don't have the software, um, I would recommend you type it into Excel. Um, Cause I mean, I haven't done integers by hand since high school. I don't know about you guys. Okay, no, we also used Excel yeah. before. No. So look, uh, the software is nice because it's got them built in, but you can build it into Excel or MATLAB or whatever programs you might have. Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay, Neil. Uh, also, I believe the University of Free State has a free Excel sheet they compiled with all the formulas and testing you can also yeah. use no we'll go through I that think it's, it's uh, okay <laughs> yeah no that's that's fc neil that's uh, exactly what we're going to go through with a sustainable yield um okay. yeah it doesn't it doesn't have all of them but it does have power rice yeah okay okay guys so can i carry on with the slideshow Yes. yes, you may. Yes. Okay. Can we see PowerPoint again? Yep. Cool. Okay, so the next section we're going to go through is pumping tests. The duration of your pump test is dependent on the envisaged use of the borehole. You know, tests on monitoring or, uh, sorry, Antonio. I think uh, Britain uh, reached USDS. I see the, the link below. So uh, I think it's for solve uh, aquifer test and analyzing from whatever level we are doing. Uh, sorry, Antonio. I, I see you shared a link. Um, I didn't catch much of what you said there. Um, but maybe if you can type in the chat and then we can all have a look what that um, that link is, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, but I, I think is I think that's the the spreadsheets for the USGS. Um, I know they've got quite a big pack of them, but they're all in the the American unit, so it's feet per second and gallon per minute. So in South Africa, we struggle a bit to to convert everything. But thank you for sharing that. Okay, so your tests on monitoring or characterization boreholes could be as short as two to three hours, but your large water supply boreholes, you need to do sort of 48 to 72 hours um, at minimum, just to make sure that they can sustain what you wanna do with them. And this is where the science 10299 comes in again. It is section four of the 10299. 
You see with livestock or domestic use, they accept an extended step test. Um, hand pump, same thing, extended step test. Where you've got a low cost impact on failure, such as your irrigation, where it's uh, subsistence farming or something like that, you can get away with a step test of four hours and they would recommend a constant discharge rate of 24 hours. And with high cost impact on failures, that'll be for your irrigation, your village water supply, your small town water supply on a low yield borehole, you're gonna do 48 hours constant discharge rate. The factory where the water supply is not critical, you'll do 48 hours as well. With a high yield borehole for a town water supply, you're gonna do 72 hours just to make sure that you're not in a, a localized dolomite cavity or something. Factory, gonna do 100 hours. And the power station where there's a massive impact if you run out of water, you're gonna do anything between 48 to 720 hours. But I don't know of any power stations that rely entirely of ground, on groundwater. Okay, so this is the, yes, yes. Um, I just wanted to check if you have a estimate or ballpark on what you classify as a high or low yielding borehole. I've used five liters per second as a ballpark, but I just wanted mm. to check your opinion on that. Uh, look, it depends on where you're working. Um, yeah, like down in the Cape, you can get boreholes three, four liters a second, but in Mpumalanga, you're not going to see them that much. Uh, but in, in general for South Africa, you know, five liters a second and above is a high yielding borehole. But, um, you know, that's region dependent. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at our hydrogeological maps, um, they also sort of cut it off at five liters a second and above in South Africa. But uh, when I drilled in DRC, five liters a second was considered a dry borehole because the average yield there was 20 to 30 liters a second. So it all comes down to your region and your project requirements. Okay. So first type of pumping test is a step test or a variable discharge rate test. We use this to determine the borehole efficiency as well as an optimal rate for the constant discharge rate test that we're going to follow. So you can see here, discharge in step one, step two, step three, and then step four. Everyone is an equal time period. So generally your steps are either 30 or 60 minutes long, uh, just to get a nice spread of data. You do three to four steps depending on your water level response. Uh, typically you'll design it on three steps and it'll go step one, 30% of your measured blow yield, then 40 to 60% on the step two, 75 to 100% on step three, and then 90 to 110, 120% on step four of your blow yield. Because sometimes what happens with your blow yield is you blow the water back into the formation. So the borehole is actually stronger than your, your measured blow yield. Okay, so we understand what the step test is and what it does. It's borehole efficiency. Yes, Victor? Oh, thanks, Matthew. <clears throat> what What would happen if, like, uh, in a situation where now uh, the pump that you are using it's 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 actually it's up to like a certain uh, uh, yield? Uh, am I going to use the the very same method of uh, uh, percentage of low yield? If let's say, for example, I'm using a pump that can only supply like three liters per second, or uh, mm. uh, am I? Yes. Am I going to use the very same method of percentage blow yield or this another alternative? Unfortunately, there's no alternative. You know, if you've got a fixed rate pump, then you kind of have to do a fixed rate test from the start. Um, you know, some people will choke their pumps. They'll put like a tap on the pump and they'll physically close the, the tap 
and they'll force it to be a lower yield but that damages your pump because you can have sort of back pressure onto your pumping equipment um, but unfortunately if you can't vary the pump rate then you have to go straight into a constant discharge rate test okay thanks thanks a lot Demet. no cool uh, typically, and I mean, maybe Kes, uh, you know, you can add in, yeah, um, you know, for your step tests, a mono pump is one of the best ones you can use where you've got your gears on the engine so it can uh, pump faster and slower. You know, submersible pumps are a little bit less um, variable. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, the cases where we've used submersible pumps, uh, we have a VSD to control the to control the submersible pump um, revs, and then you can control the flow rate through that. But a mono pump is a bit easier for this for the pumping tests. Mm, no, that's it, and also your VSDs are quite finicky, if I remember correctly. You know, getting your revs right and that. Yeah, there's there's a few different options um, that make it either easier or harder. But yeah, it's it's generally I think. A high percentage of test contractors are using mono pumps just for that reason. No, thanks. Uh, does everybody know when we talk about a, a mono pump? Does everybody know what that is? Anybody not? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Okay. So yeah. a mono pump is where you've got your rods that go down the hole and the motor is on surface. Yeah, your motor turns the rods, which then lift the water up through the rods instead of like a submersible pump where you've got your motor inside the pump, which is sitting inside the borehole. And uh, that sucks the, yeah. Uh, so it's okay. like uh, different types of displacement. Mm, thanks. Okay, cool. And then a VSD that Kes was talking about is a variable speed drive. So that just varies the way the motor spins at the submersible pump. Okay. So the constant discharge rate test, your water is abstracted at a constant rate and your water level response is measured both during the abstraction period and at recovery. So once you switch your pump off, you're going to measure the recovery of the water level. Um, that this for me is quite important. This is more important than your actual drawdown, in my opinion. Because, um, you know, if you think about it in a cast environment, you might get one meter drawdown during a pump test over 100 hours. But if you don't get recovery in that borehole after you stop pumping, then it's not sustainable. Yeah, so recovery is just as important as drawdown in the the constant, rate, constant discharge rate test. In your setup, you're going to have your pump down at the bottom with your level logger or your dip meter. And Jen sets your discharge pipe. Make sure that it's far away enough not to impact your, your pumping borehole. Because if you discharge here, you're within your abstraction drawdown cone. And the water is just going to come straight back into your borehole. You're going to get no drawdown, but you've created your own recharge boundary. And where you're lucky enough, you're going to have a, an observation well. So we call this the abstraction borehole. And then this is your observation borehole. I think that question came up earlier. Where do we uh, monitor and what do we monitor for? Okay, Antonio? Um. Sorry, Antonio, I didn't hear much of what you said there. Um, I, I think you're having a bit of internet issues today. Would you be able to type that out, what you were saying? Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. I will keep the chat window open just so that I can see uh, what you were saying there. Okay, so and then this is what you got your cone of depression, your piezometric level, your water level before you started pumping. This is your drawdown or S, your aquifer, aquaclude. So this is obviously a confined aquifer. And then your observation wells. So your pump test gives a much more accurate conductivity or transmissivity value than your slug tests. You use this, this is like I said in the beginning, the only way you can really determine sustainable yield for a borehole. Okay, sorry, I'm just gonna stop for Antonio. So what is the recommended water column for a transducer? Um, typically you'll set your transducer below your pump, just to make sure that um, you know, you're not going to pump past your transducer because then it's going to be an open air. So if my pump is at 70 meters, I usually try to put my transducer either at the top of the pump, so 69 meters, or underneath the pump if it's safe to do so. I'm just trying to get back to the chat here. Okay, no, great. So storage can only be calculated if you have an observation well during the test. So even though your equity solve and the FC programs will give you a storage value, you can only ever get a realistic one or a representative one if you have this uh, observation well because then you're calculating, you're physically calculating the storage that is being used during the pump test. You can physically see your, your drawdown curve, your cone of depression. Does that make sense to everybody why you can only do storage with an observation well? Anybody confused with that concept? Uh, may you please repeat the explanation, Matthew? Okay. So when you're calculating your storage, which is your, your S, your specific storage, specific yield, whatever component you're looking for, if you only have the pumped well monitoring data where you only measure water levels at your pumped borehole, you've got no idea what this cone of depression shape looks like. It might be flat. It might be a V shaped. You know, so then you, you're pulling storage, you applying a value for the whole aquifer when it actually only applies to this area that you're drawing down from. Whereas if you've got an observation well, you get a better idea of your shape of the cone of depression. And that gives you a more representative estimate of storage available in the aquifer unit. Mm. So then would that mean that it, it would be like better to have like two observation boreholes like on either side of your, of your well? It definitely. Um, the, the more the merrier kind of thing when it comes to pump testing and observations. Um, mm -hmm. The more data you have, the more value you can add. Okay, thank you. Okay, Neil? Uh, what happens if I don't have a drawdown in my observation well and it's basically around 15 meters from my pumping well? Well, then you've got a, have you got, uh, have you got drawdown in your pumping well? Uh, yeah, I got about, I think, three meters and I pumped that 20 liters a second. And how was the recovery in the pumping well? The recovery took about, I can't remember now, but I think 30 minutes. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, look, there's either a, you're in a very strong aquifer, so the drawdown effect is very limited, um, or there's a boundary, you know, as luck would have it, between your observation borehole, but I don't think so, because then you would see a response in your drawdown at the pumping borehole. Yeah, it, it was mostly caustic dolomite, so... Ah, there we go. So you just got this limited sort of uh, blip in terms of a drawdown cone. Yeah. Yeah, and I bet your transmissivity was like in the thousands, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was quite <laughs> high. <laughs> no, that's it. Uh, yeah, sometimes it happens. Um, but I'll go through the top curves um, in Excel just now. Yeah, just quickly. Popelo. Matthew, I'm not sure if you covered it already, right? But I mm. want to know how far must your pumping well be from the observation borehole? Well, there's no limit to it. Um, typically less than 200 meters because then you'll actually see something. But um, you can do however far you want. As long as you know that distance, then you can do the calculations. There's no sort of set in stone limit for an observation well. Okay, but then the further apart or the closer they apart they are from each other, then that's going to affect your readings, right? Well, you'll see a response if they're close. Um, so you'll actually have readings. Yeah, otherwise, like Neil mentioned, they were 15 meters apart, but there was no response. So if there's no response, you know, it doesn't really help your calculation if they're far apart, does it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So as long as you know the distance, that's the important thing, whether it's five meters or 500 meters, as long as you know that distance, you can put it into the equations. Okay. Okay. So this is sort of what your graphs will look like. You've got Q, which is your pumping rate over time. And then your water level response over time as well. Your step drawdown, you go up, 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 and then your water level responds accordingly. You let it recover. Always let it recover after your step test. You can't just pick it up and keep pumping because then you're not getting a representative pump test. Yeah, let it recover fully or to 95% at least. Keep it at a constant pumping rate. Get your drawdown you measure your recovery. You see at recovery, there's no pumping. Okay, this is your measurement frequency. This is a recommended frequency. Um, so when you do your pump test for zero to 10 minutes, you do at least every minute. I personally do 30 seconds up to five minutes and then one minute up to 10. And then 10 to 20 minutes, you do every two minutes every five minutes up to an hour, every 15 minutes up to three hours, and then every 30 minutes up to six hours, and then every hour until you've finished, you know, from six hours onwards. Yes, Patrick? Yeah. Have you come across a case where your observation borehole is located in an aquifer? which is separated and not connected to the aquifer in which you are doing the pumping test before? Um, I haven't come across it personally in, um, you know, in the field, but um, what will happen then is you'll get your invisible well effect because you'll intersect that boundary between the two boreholes. So you'll see a dramatic increase in drawdown on your pumping borehole and you'll pick up on your curve um, there's a boundary. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to go through um, the top curves, how to fit the curves and see what kind of boundaries you've intersected uh, just now. Okay. okay. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Popelo. Matthew, I want to ask, like, what challenges do you face when conducting pump tests on the field, in the field, sorry? 
challenges in terms of what? Uh, personal challenges, equipment challenges? Both. Like what are the typical and common challenges that you face in the field when conducting pump tests? Well, look, I mean, on a personnel level, it, it's boring, um, especially when you get to the hour intervals. You know, guys do fall asleep. I've had technicians fall asleep after six hours on a 36-hour pump test. Um, your dip meter gets stuck on the pipes. That's quite a common one. You know, as you're trying to measure, because you're lowering the water table, your pump equipment is getting heavier and heavier. So it tends to pull to one side of the casing and sometimes it can get stuck on your dip meter. And then you lose like an hour or two when you're trying to pull out your dip meter. Uh, batteries run flat in your dip meters, your battery on your stopwatch will run flat, generators will run out of fuel, generators will break, you'll get chased away from the ball by something. Yeah, it's lots of lots of things that happen during contests. Okay, thank you. I was just curious. <laughs> no, look, I mean, I've been chased away by an ostrich. Um, yeah, and the generator ran out of fuel and I had to restart the whole pump test again. So there's, anything can happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so this book, Chrisman and Derrida, yeah, there's a 1991 version, but mine is 1994. But this one, the analysis and evaluation of pumping test data is sort of my go-to. Whenever I do a pump test, I flick through this quickly just to see if there's anything um, you know, important for me to note about my site and what the data looks like. So if you can, I'd recommend getting hold of this book. You know, Google it, ask the library, make photocopies if you can. Yeah, this is really an important book. Okay, and when you do your graphs, you know, just pure, I'll go through it now with you guys. Um, well, actually, I'll make a separate video if you guys don't mind, you know, just so that I can figure out the screen switching. But um, what you do here is you just plot your drawdown data and your time data. And you do it first on a log-log graph, and then secondly on a linear drawdown graph and a log um, time graph and you can see the shapes of your graphs so part a and a prime is a confined aquifer system this is the kind of shape that it will give you you see how it flattens out over time your drawdown sort of reaches a peak then an unconfined aquifer will have this kind of shape and then a leaky aquifer will have this initial drop and then a flatten out there so these these curves are, are very important like I said I'm going to do a, a separate video for you guys just so that I can do it nicely sorry I see I'm running out of time here but um, make a note of this for me please and then further to this you also got your log log and then semi log your confined this is what we deal with in South Africa is your dual porosity aquifer so you see we've got fracture flow maybe, then it goes into matrix, then it goes back into fracture. Your pumped well in a single plane and your pumped well in a fractured dike. Just make notes of these. I'll do a separate thing and post it up um, during the course of the weekend for you guys, sorry. And here's what I was telling you. Um, I think, Patrick, you asked the question about how you're going to know if you've got a, a barrier between your boreholes. Now, with a recharge boundary where you get like a river or a lake or something that you're interacting with, you can see over time you get an initial drawdown. And then when your drawdown cone reaches that, it flattens out. You get no drawdown. It just flattens out completely where... It should be going here, but it just flattens out. And it makes sense because it's not abstracting anymore. You're just like pulling directly from the river or whatever it is. 
And then if you reach a barrier, same thing. It just keeps getting steeper and steeper and steeper because with the invisible well effect, you're depleting your storage at like an exponential rate. Initially, you're doing it at a one-to-one -one ratio, sort of one meter down is one meter across. And then when you reach that boundary, you start going two meters down, four meters down, etc., because it can't move outwards anymore. Do these curves make sense to you guys, like these barrier and recharge curves specifically? Yes. Yes. Great. Because these curves add so much value to your interpretation. You can say, no, we intersected a recharge boundary at 600 minutes, which is most likely this river or that dam or, you know, or you can say we've got a barrier in between. Um, you know, so just remember, and it, it makes perfect sense in my mind. If I've got a barrier, I'm extracting more, so I'm going to get more drawdown. If I've got a recharge boundary where water is coming into my borehole, then it's going to have no drawdown. But you've still got this initial drawdown in the recharge boundary. It's not like the caustic aquifer that Neil is referring to. Okay, so these ones, like I said, I'm just going to skim it quickly, but I'll do a proper video this weekend for everyone. Sorry about that, it's just gone on a bit longer than I thought it would. Okay, in the pumping test analysis, we use typically the Cooper-Jacob method, which is a straight line approximation of the taste equation. There's unsteady flow or transient state flow into a fully penetrating well in a confined aquifer. You ignore the well bore storage and your equation is drawdown is equal to 2.303 discharge rate, four pi times transmissivity, log base 10 of 2.25 transmissivity times time by your radial distance, your well, um, your borehole radius or the radius between the borehole and your observation well and your storage. This equation you guys sh should know from varsity storm. Okay, so by drawing a straight line through the data on a plot of drawdown or S versus log of time, so semi-log graph, we can determine your transmissivity and your storage, your storativity from the following equations. So you see it just changes that one to get transmissivity, so a change in head. So that's a change in drawdown over a, a log cycle. Where is it now? Yeah, so there we go, sorry per log cycle. So that's why you need to do at least 180 minutes or 120 minutes to get a log cycle of your data so that your Cooper-Jacob equation works. Then your storage, that R squared is ideally the distance between your pumping borehole and your observation borehole. Otherwise, it's just an approximation. And then T0 is the intercept of your line on the time axis over here in your storage equation. Is everybody comfortable with Cooper Jacob? Yes. Yes. Everybody's seen it before. Everybody know what it is. Yep. Great. Yeah. I'm just going to, would you guys mind if I stopped it here tonight um, and then we can pick it up in a video, either we can do something on Monday or I can just post a video on the weekend and then you guys can comment.